All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Q&A with Sir Anthony Buzzard. We're about to start. This is our website, focusonthekingdom.org. If you'd like to find out who we are, what we're all about, we're a non-Trinitarian ministry. You can click on the links there, beliefs, and check us out. Also, we have the latest magazine published every month now for more than 20 years, I believe, that uh, Sir Anthony edits, and that's the Focus on the Kingdom magazine. So if you click on magazine and you have there September 2021, today is September the 3rd. We do the Q&A every month now, once a month, and uh, just click on September and you should be able to see that, a PDF. You can download it, share it, and please do. And uh, the first article there from Ken, Kenneth Laprade, one of our regular contributors to the magazine. So thank you, Kenneth. Okay, so we're about to start. We have a lot of questions. So if you have any questions out there for Sir Anthony, please type them in all caps so I can see them, all caps, if you could. So before we begin, usually... We go through questions, we get there in the week. So I'll bring up Anthony. Good evening, Anthony. Hi, Carlos. Yeah, good use of the technology on your part. Uh, some interesting questions tonight. They are good questions by people who are obviously studying the Bible and have some excellent points to make. All right, so let's get right to it. We, Like I said, we have a lot to get through. And if you have any, if you're watching live tonight, Thanks for joining us. Just type them in once again in the chat in all caps so I can see them better. Mm. When the kingdom comes, who will be left alive on earth to live out their lives and Christians to reign over as priests and kings? Okay, that's an interesting question. And it's obvious, matter of common sense, you can't be ruling over nobody. And the saints will be immortalized at the second coming, the Greek word parousia, the second and only arrival in glory of Jesus in the future. So that's a good question. If all these people are immortalized, that's to say the saints of all the ages, Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the prophets, and all the New Testament true believers are given immortality, who in the world then is left to reign over? And the answer is very clear in Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 6, is one of masses of rather grim pictures of the opposition that Jesus will confront when he comes back. The world is not want, going to want Jesus to take over his throne in Jerusalem and rule the world. He's not going to, the world will not like that. And so it's going to be a struggle. And in Isaiah 24, the earth is going to be completely laid waste in three. Isaiah 24, verse 3, the earth has been polluted, how very true that is, by its in inhabitants. They've transgressed laws, violated statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, cursed of ours the earth. The earth is in a very bad shape when Christ comes back, and those who live in it are held guilty, and rightly so. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. That's to say the wicked ones are going to be burned, not tortured forever, but burned up, destroyed. And then it says, few people are left. There you go. Few are left. Those few are people who are waking up just in time to be let into the kingdom as mortals. They're not ready to be immortalized, but they provide the citizens, if you like, of that future kingdom. The true people of God, the prophets and the saints and Jesus himself, will be the supervisors of that new age to come, that new, brand new kingdom. But there'll be human beings who are not immortalized, not ready for that yet. Few will be left. That's brilliant. Of course, how few is few? I have no idea. There will be a considerable depopulation of the world, but few people will be left. Now, I want to warn you against the Seventh-day Adventists here, I think a million of them across the world. They didn't like this idea of a few people being left for the kingdom citizens. 
So they got rid of those words. That's what people will do. If they don't like something in the Bible, they just go dot, 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 dot. They leave it out. If you look in the book by Ellen G. White called The Great Controversy, and look up what she does with Isaiah 24, verse 6. She reads, A curse devours the earth. Those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. And she stops there. She simply leaves out the phrase, few people are left. Because her concept is that Satan will be alone on the earth for a thousand years. That's very, very bad. No, no, Satan is going to be put in the abyss, banished from the earth entirely, and Jesus will rule on the earth with his immortalized saints who cannot possibly die. And there will be a human population. How few is you? I don't know. But that population, of course, will grow very quickly. If you have big families, that will then amount to many, many people, and they will be supervised, managed by the saints and Jesus at his future parousia. Okay. All right. Thank you. There's also the uh, passage in uh, another passage in Isaiah. I'm trying to look for it. Sixty-five. Yep. Yeah. If you want to talk about. Absolutely. Will be left on earth. Isaiah 65 is a very fine passage to show your friends, and we're hoping that you're going to show your friends all of these truths. Isaiah 65, verse 17 and following is outstandingly good. Jeremiah, Isaiah, I should say, 65 and verse 17 reads as follows. Look, behold. I'm creating a new heaven, a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I'm creating. God speaking there. For behold, I, God, am creating Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice. Look at the joy and the excitement, the happiness in this passage. I'll rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. What marvelously encouraging and exciting prospect is offered by this future view of the kingdom. For the youth, in verse 30, will die at the age of 100. That's interesting. If somebody dies at 100, they'll be considered just a young chap. That points to an extraordinary longevity. We don't know how old. But you know that people in Bible times, Methuselah was the great example, dying, what, 900 and something. But even people like uh, Abraham lived until he was 175 years old. That's marvelous. This is going to be reproduced. These are mortal people who will be reckoned to be just young if they die at, at what for us is the very advanced age of 100 years. So there you have it. Okay. All right, thank you. So mm. we will move on to the next question. Mm. Where in the Old Testament do you find the belief that the Jewish Messiah would come to end Judaism? Okay, that's an interesting question. There isn't a vast amount of information. A lot of that comes in the New Covenant. In fact, they weren't sure, many of the people in New Covenant times, they weren't sure about Jesus dying. That was a shock to them when they first were told, by the way, Jesus said, we're going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. And their natural reaction was this. Oh, no, Jesus, you couldn't do that. You're the Messiah. You're going to rule the world. You're not going to die. But then they discovered in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who bore the sins of the world. So that put an end to that nonsense. But in that passage in Isaiah, there's a, there is a comment which says that the covenant will be made great by the Messiah. He's going to honor the covenant. I don't have that verse exactly before me, but it would be in Isaiah 53 somewhere. He will make the covenant honorable. He will magnify, that's the word. He will magnify the covenant and make it honorable. The new covenant was not the most enjoyable thing. Even in Acts 15, verse 11, you will find that the apostles themselves said, the old covenant law was a burden for us. We had to keep it, but it wasn't the ultimate uh, uh, in terms of what God wanted. And so the rabbis used to say, 
that when the Messiah comes visibly to establish his kingdom, he will introduce laws which he had never introduced before. So the information there is, is meager, but the text is about magnifying the covenant. There it is. The Lord was pleased for the sake of his righteousness to magnify his covenant. I think the word covenant is in there too somewhere. Uh, let me just look at that, Isaiah 42, 21, and we'll see. The word covenant, I think, occurs in the Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken, but we'll check that. In Isaiah 42 and 21. Uh, there's the Hebrew on the screen, if you... Okay. Um, yeah, there's one where you have the word covenant, if you could find it in this section of Scripture. He will make the covenant honorable i'm not sure which verse that is offhand i'm sorry i didn't find that one before well but the, the actual word covenant which is teaching of course it's the same thing yeah the yeah the question has to do i guess with the laws commandments like the sabbath so yeah that's yes. a good text too isaiah 42 21 saying that yes. um and, and i would also throw in i guess deuteronomy 18 about yes. the prophet who who people now have to listen to mm -hmm. another prophet, not mm -hmm. Moses, and mm -hmm. that's Deuteronomy 18. Mm -hmm. The word covenant is somewhere there in Isaiah 40 to 45. I don't know if you can find that. The word covenant, I'm sure, occurs. But the teaching is the same thing. Covenant is teaching. The covenant of Moses is the teaching of Moses. The covenant of Messiah is the law or Torah of Messiah. People don't know about that. There's a law of Messiah which is not, I repeat, not the same as the Torah of Moses. So he will make the covenant honorable, um, I think, is probably there. Yeah, try 42.6. Yes, that sounds promising. 42.6. The Lord has called you for a righteous purpose, and I will take hold of your hand, and I will keep you and appoint you, appoint the Messiah, to be a covenant for the people, that is, and a light to the nations. So Jesus himself is that new covenant. That's to say, the new covenant is the teaching of Jesus, namely the gospel of the kingdom. The old covenant is defunct now. And many Christians are trying hard to keep the law of Moses when they shouldn't be doing that. In fact, it weakens their Christianity because only the law of Messiah is now binding. Now, the passage you take your friends to is found in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3, verse 19 to 29. There's 10 verses. Paul says, what's the point of the law? And the law he's talking about here is a law that was added to the Abrahamic covenant, added at the time of Moses. But it was only until the seed, the Messiah, would come, then it stopped. The law of Moses is defunct for Christians. Read Galatians chapter 3, 19 to 29. You have the whole thing beautifully summarized. Paul is against the works of the law, meaning those Jewish peculiar laws, Sabbath keeping, observance of food laws, uh, keeping the new moons, keeping the festivals. That's part of the law of works and circumcision in the flesh is forbidden to Christians for religious reasons. Now, if you want to do it for medical reasons, that's quite a different thing. But even physical circumcision, which was commanded in Genesis 19 for everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, it's strictly forbidden for religious reasons, according to the gospel of Messiah found in Galatians 3 and other passages. So that's a stark difference. In fact, it's the difference, if you look at Galatians 4 sometime, between Hagar and Sarah. Sarah, who had a child miraculously, remember, is the symbol of the new covenant. Hagar is the symbol of the old, now defunct, finished, obsolete covenant. Don't go under the old covenant. 
when the new covenant commands you to be in the new covenant, which is nothing to do with keeping food laws, Sabbath, holy days, new moons, all of that is gone. Physical circumcision for religious yep. readings, that's gone. All right, let's uh, keep it moving. We mm. have many questions. If you have any questions, if you're watching live, please type them in all caps so I can see them easier. Yep. And here's the next one, Anthony. Mm. If Paul is against Sabbath keeping <clears throat> yeah. in Romans 14 and Colossians 2, then what law mm. is he talking about keeping in Romans 2 and 3? So let's have a look at those texts before uh, I pass it over to you. So for Romans 2.13, for it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And then Romans 3.31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law so again the question so if paul is against the law the law of moses the law of god then what law is he talking about in this uh, it's an excellent question you've got to stop and think very hard here paul is absolutely against the law of moses that's demonstrably true the law of works but he's not against the overall law of god so you stop and say okay what law am i as a christian under what law as a pauline christian paul was a jew and a christian what law is he under that's the law which is distinct from what paul calls the works of the law which are those jewish particularly and peculiar uh, elements of law which were required for jewish people I, I just rehearsed them in the previous question i'll say it again physical circumcision for religious reasons that's out that was commanded in the old covenant forbidden in the new so you simply have to say what paul what law is paul advocating as being permanent it cannot be the law of works which he says is finished so it's all of the other laws of god the law of love the law of your neighbor of loving your neighbor and many other good things. That's what Paul has in mind in terms of the law. Yep, and uh, he uses a text here also. This is very important. First Corinthians 9. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. That is the law of Moses, obviously. And then note in verse 21 how for Paul now, the law of god as you see there though i am not free from god's law but i am under or subject to the law of christ or christ's law so now we went from the law of moses that the jews are under to the law of christ which is now amazingly enough anthony now it's synonymous with the law of god absolutely that's brilliant. That text is absolutely indispensable in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, the one that Carlos has up there. Paul is a Christian. Paul is a Jew. But he says in verse 20, now to Jewish people, I became like a Jew in order to win them. To those under the law, that's Jewish people under the law of Moses, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law i paul am a christian i'm a jew i'm not under that law so you have to simply say what law am i as a christian under the answer is it's not those elements of the law which distinguish israel from the rest of the nation sabbath keeping holy days physical circumcision all of that's defunct if you don't understand that you're in danger of getting the wrong gospel the gospel is defined by the teaching of Jesus and expounded further by Paul. You know, Jesus said, I can't tell you everything now. Some of it was left for Paul to develop. Paul, for instance, develops the idea that physical circumcision is quite unnecessary for anyone in the New Covenant. As I just said before, you can do it for medical reasons. That's another thing. But you're not going to gain any favor with God at all, period, Jew or Gentile, by being physically circumcised now. 
That's the stark difference between the old and new covenant. Finally, I'll say this in Galatians 5, 2, you have that same Torah of Messiah. So Paul distinguishes, and you must in your Bible study, between the Torah of Moses, which was only until Christ came, and the Torah of Messiah, which is ongoing until the ages to come even, all the Christian eras that may lie ahead of us before the second coming. All right, thank you. Mm. Next question. Now, this is a, a bit tricky and will require some ex explaining, but here's the question. You have said the Masoretic vowel pointings are wrong in Psalm 110, verse 3. So how do you know they are correct in verse 1? So if you check... Uh, a good Bible study, a good commentary, you will see that it's not just us saying uh, there might be corruption at verse 3. So that's this verse here. Uh, most English translations really are not very um, clear because the Hebrew is not clear. So, you know, things like your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. I mean, what does that even mean? So it's almost unintelligible in English. And that's because in the Hebrew, again, but you must do a, a little bit of research. Uh, textual scholars believe there was some kind of uh, corruption or uh, errors in the, in the Hebrew there. And uh, so the question is... Uh, if that's the case, how do we know that the famous verse 1, and I'll bring it up here. Uh, so the Lord says, to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that has, as far as we know, no errors, no textual variants, no problems, no corruptions, unlike verse 3. So what can you say? About well, I say, first of all, I, I, I dispute the the premise here. I don't think I ever wrote, if I ever wrote, you, please tell me, I didn't say the Masoretic vowel points were wrong. I did say there's a variation there. And the Septuagint varies from the Hebrew, and that, that will be sometimes the case. Actually, there's a very fascinating thing going on here in 110 verse 3. You have a possibility of yaldotecha, meaning your youth, as to think from yeliditecha, I'll say it again, yeliditecha, I have begotten you. That's a matter of pointing in the Hebrew. I'm not saying either one is wrong. I don't know which was the original. I know that the Septuagint reads that as I have begotten you. So, so just quickly, right. Anthony, yep. why don't we know um, this is the word? Mm. Uh, so why don't we know, unlike mm. verse 1, where we do know for sure, why why don't we know here in this case? in verse Well, we just don't know because we've got manuscripts in Hebrew that read, I have begotten you, and the Septuagint read, I have begotten you. Other Hebrew manuscripts read Yeliditicha. So whenever they were putting the points in, the Masoretes themselves disagreed on how to point that. So it's right. not a so question there, of one being wrong. So the there's other. a difference uh, between the Hebrew manuscripts yes. regarding what they call the vowel points, which yes. are those dots you see That's right. at the bottom. So mm -hmm. Hebrew manuscripts vary regarding this verse. They do. But... That's not the case in verse 1? That That's right? absolutely right. There's no Hebrew variation at all. The word there for my Lord is Adoni. No possible variation. There are no alternatives. That means to my non-deity Lord. Adoni, with the L on the front, the L on the front there, Ladoni means two. The word is Adoni. That word occurs 195 times in the Hebrew Bible and always refers not to God. It's a non-deity title. So if your translation reads capital L-O-R-D, it's misleading you. Every other time the word Adoni occurs, they will correctly translate it with a little L-O-R-D, a non-deity Lord. But here, because they thought, well, it must apply to Jesus, which it does, 
and Jesus is God, they stuck a capital L on there. There are some translations and most commentators get this right. There should be no capital L there, uh, no capital A. No capital L, I'm trying to get this right here. Lord, capital Lord is for God only. Non-capital Lord, Adoni, means non-deity. So it's not quite the same situation as verse 3, where there's actually a variant in the Hebrew manuscripts. There's no variant here. There's no problem with Adoni. It just shouldn't have a capital L in translating. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit complicated. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it, it merits. Again, some some of these questions are, are very yeah. good. They are. Uh, they do require, though, you to go and check it That's out right. for yourselves. That's right. Uh, because also remember, don't believe anything we say. <laughs> check it out for okay. yourself. The Acts yep. 1711. Yes, All right. good. Uh, let's see. The next one, the next question. What is the Holy Spirit's role in our lives, Anthony? It's an interesting question. I, I would ask a, a question in return. What is God's role in your life? The Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is God in action. God extending himself to the human race in various ways, speaking through you, bearing on events in your life, and so on. So that's simply saying, what is God's role in your life? God works through his spirit. Now, his spirit is very personal. Don't ever say the spirit of God is not personal. It's very personal because my spirit coming to you is my mind and my thinking, my disposition coming to you, expressed in words. God's spirit is very personal, but not a third person. The spirit in the Bible is either God acting in the world or Jesus, indistinguishably, wouldn't matter. The effect would be the same, but it's not a third person. I'll tell you why, because the Spirit never sends any greetings in letters. The Spirit is never prayed to and is never um, asked for things, never petitioned. <coughs> Excuse me, so that makes it absolutely clear that the Spirit is not a third person. So can we add one text here, Carlos, perhaps? That's the verse in 2 Corinthians 3.17. 2 Corinthians 3.17. <coughs> uh, yep, let me, while you take a break there, 2 Corinthians 3.17, which is the famous uh, uh, tri triple reference. I think that's what you're going for. So... Let's see. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Oh, okay, it's the Lord is the Spirit. So, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, it depends. Uh, the Lord that, uh, is the Spirit. So, the Spirit in your life is God active in your life. And where that Spirit of the Lord, he clarifies it, right? It's the Spirit of the Lord. I repeat this. The Spirit of God is never, ever a third person. Never. The Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus, that's a phrase you find occasionally, it is God or Jesus in action. So I hope that's clear. You'll find this in great detail in our two books on the Trinity, uh, Self-Inflicted Wound, and the other one on Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian. And at our website, a lot of material. If you search in the search engine there, look up Spirit, and you'll find a massive of stuff. If you are a Bible teacher and want to take this seriously, you really want to get clear on that. My translation is now available, I believe, free online. So that's good. A lot of footnotes, which will supply more information. Yep. And um, mm -hmm. I would, for this topic, recommend Jesus was not a Trinitarian. Yes. And you deal with the Holy Spirit. But mm -hmm. since we're in the Holy Spirit, mm. uh, let's get to the following question, which is related. Mm-hmm. If the Holy Spirit is not a separate person, mm -hmm. why do you use the the word uh, grief in yeah. your translation? And by the way, this is Sir Anthony's translation slash commentary. You can read online at onegodtranslation.com. That's one word, onegodtranslation.com. 
Thank you to Lori and her team for providing this free service. And uh, here we have an example, or the example, I think the questioner is asking, Ephesians 4.30. So you translate there, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. So if you do not believe this, the Holy Spirit is a separate, distinct person apart from God, why do you use that word grieve? Well, because the Spirit is God in action. Don't grieve God. It doesn't make it, it makes no difference at all whether you say, don't grieve God, don't grieve his Spirit, because the Lord is the Spirit. We just read that. God in action in your life, Jesus in action in your life in various ways, is the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus. You don't want to grieve Jesus. You don't want to grieve God. Actually, we should also give them, Carlos, if we may, 1 John 2, 1, where it is said that Jesus is the Spirit. He's the Paracletos, the Comforter. Jesus is the Comforter. But in the Gospel of John, you will find that that Comforter seems to be somebody other than Jesus. It's not. It's Jesus in action. So let me offer you this too. In the Gospel of John, you'll find that Jesus says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I get it. I'm going away. But you're not going to be on your own. I, Jesus, are coming. I'm coming to you as the Paracletos, the Comforter. That's exactly what we find in 1 John 2 1. So the Spirit of God is God in action. Jesus in action, God uh, expressing himself in various different ways. Not so hard. You have to sit down and think about this, and I think it will all become quite clear. All right. Uh, let's mm -hmm. get to the next question. Again, if you have any questions, I'll get to you soon. We're going through questions we get during the week. So let's get to the Let's see the uh, what's yeah. the right translation for First Thessalonians four sixteen? JWs, that is Jehovah's Witnesses, say this means Jesus is the archangel. So as you can see there in Anthony's translation, you have there for the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, accompanied by the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Messiah will rise first. So as, as you know, as some of you might know out there, this is a classicist textix, a classic text for the JWs to say that Jesus there, Anthony, is the archangel Michael. And my response would be, I hope not uh, to be uh, too striking or clever here, but then is Jesus also the accompanying angel? It doesn't say anything about the archangel being Jesus. It simply says, if you could put the text back up for us one more time, the Lord himself, that's Jesus here, will come down from heaven at his second coming, accompanied by a shout of command, accompanied by the voice of the archangel. It doesn't say he is the archangel. It doesn't say he is the trumpet. The trumpet sound of God accompanies Jesus. Doesn't mean Jesus is the trumpet. So the archangel's voice, that's Michael in this case, accompanies Jesus at his second coming. And this is the great final moment of this present age when the dead will be raised. So it's absolutely unquestionable there that the trumpet and the archangel are accompanying that event. Absolute proof of this is found in Hebrews chapter 2, isn't it? And Hebrews chapter 2 says, To which of the angels did God ever say, You're my son? That's probably actually earlier in Hebrews. It occurs twice, but you'll find it in the first chapter there, that one. To which of the angels did God ever say? The answer is, he never said it to any angel. God never, ever, ever said these words to any angel at any time whatsoever. You're my son today, I have fathered you. So Jesus cannot be an angel based on that obvious evidence there. The whole point, I repeat, the whole point of Jesus 
is that he has to be the second Adam. He has to be a human being because he's the model human being. He's the pioneer of salvation. And thus he couldn't be an angel. That would be the wrong category entirely. Angels are created supernaturally in the past, of course. They're there at the creation from the start. Jesus was not. Jesus was begotten or procreated in the womb of his mother. That's Matthew one twenty. What has been fathered, procreated in Mary, that's Matthew one twenty, is from the activity of the Holy Spirit, supernatural. Now, this is not a difficult question at all. The Watchtower has an extraordinary grip on people's mind. Now, I don't doubt the sincerity, the enormous work that goes into door-to-door campaigning and so on. But some of the theological Bible teaching is not very good. I repeat, not very good. Namely, Jesus is a human being. He was begotten in the womb of Mary, 120 of Matthew, Luke 135, for the same point, Luke 135. You cannot anyway pre-exist yourself. So ask your friends, what in the world does pre-existence mean? How can you be older than yourself? Can you be older than your own grandfather? It's not even a common sense idea. Just eradicate that from your thinking and believe in the Messiah, Son of God, supernaturally, virginly, miraculously begotten in the womb of his mother, Mary. That's why then, when Elizabeth visited Mary, she spoke of the mother of my Lord. That's Psalm 110.1, the mother of my Lord, Messiah. Isn't this marvelous, she said, that I've come to visit the mother of my Lord. Not the mother of God. I hope you're not going to go with that one. No, no, not the mother of the angel Gabriel, not at all. But the angel of my Lord Messiah, Psalm 110.1. Yeah, I would also um, I would also go to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the very first verse is very interesting if Jesus was an angel before he became Jesus, um, Matthew says nothing about it. In fact, he calls uh, the son of God, Jesus, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And this is, as everyone knows, his gene genealogical record, actually the origin of his ge genealogical record. So this is a record of the origin of the, of the Messiah. So if the Messiah is an angel, an angel is an angel, the son of another human person or the descendant. Obviously, he's not the immediate uh, son of David, the immediate son of Abraham. Obviously, this is a descendant language. But is can an angel be the descendant of, of a human person? Uh, so I would also add that. All right, let's uh, move along here. We got many more. And um, again, I'll get to your questions soon if you're online. And uh, let's see the next one, Anthony. Yes. Can you explain what Jesus meant in John 14, verse 7? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Yes. Well, that's really not so very hard. There's a very good principle in Judaism that is, that an agent of someone is as his sponsor's person. If I operate on behalf of Carlos and he sends me out on a job, I am, so to speak, Carlos. That doesn't mean that I am literally Carlos, but the law of agency determines that the one you sent out speaks for you. And a very good example of that is in Exodus 4.15, where you'll find that Aaron was a spokesman for Moses, Aaron was the mouth of Moses. Talk to him, put the words in his mouth, put my words in his mouth, put God's, Moses' words in the mouth of Aaron. So he is, so to speak, the same as Aaron, but he's said to be the mouth then. So it's not very difficult. Agency means that you are like to the point of being identified with in some sense, not literally. 
If you take that literally, I, Jesus, am the Father, that would lead you to a very horrible notion that the Father and the Son are the same person. We know that's wrong. We know that the Father is the only one who's true God, John 17, 3. We know that Jesus recited the creed of Israel in Mark 12, 29. He was asked by a friendly Jew, what is the most important of all the commandments? And Jesus' reply was, listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's what the Greek means. The Lord our God is one Lord. How many lords is that? It's absolutely impossible. Every scholar, every theologian knows that Jews were not Trinitarians. They were very careful not to be Trinitarians. They had pledged themselves on the basis of Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, the Shema, the hero Israel, that God was a single person. He's the Father. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father. You're talking to one person there. God is a single, undivided, uncomplicated, single, divine person, not a human person, obviously, but a divine Father. It's that simple. Never ever two, never ever three, never more than three. So there's so much that's known about this now today. You can find many, many sources in my two books there, references to scholars of all ages who fully understood this. Now, they haven't always been popular when they have said this because the church is so wedded to the idea of a triune God that all three are somehow one essence. And the Bible never says that God is an essence, not once. The doctrine of the Trinity comes later. It was a gradual formation after biblical times, and it proposes that God is three persons in one essence. That's simply not biblical. That's a tradition coming from Greek philosophy. You don't need that. It's making your Bible reading much, much less clear. Yeah, I would also uh, throw in, Anthony, here. Um, actually, Jesus himself using this principle of agency in John 13, 20. He says, whoever accepts anyone I, I send as his representative accepts me. Whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. That's a very interesting hierarchical uh, situation as well, right? Hierarchy, rankings. So you got someone above Jesus, you have Jesus, and then you have us. Isn't that interesting? So there's a sequence there. And uh, as Anthony alluded to there, the Hebrew is shaliach, if you want to look that up. In Greek, it's the actually the word apostolos, which means an agent. We are agents of the Messiah, of the Son of God, and his Father, who's the only true God. So that's a very uh, good verse there to use. All right, let's move forward here, Anthony. we got many more. I'm trying to get to the live questions, so forgive me if I'm taking a while, but uh, we're mm -hmm. trying to please everyone here. Yes. Uh, let's go with this one, Anthony. Why are titles like Lord of Lords, yeah. Savior, and even God used for both the Father and the Son? Yes. Well, the word God is used mostly, 99% of the time, for the one God, the Father. But the word God has a secondary meaning. Jesus himself quoted from Psalm 82, aren't the judges called God? They were. The judges of Israel were called gods. Theos in Hebrew. Very unusual. But the Savior is also likewise used of human beings. You'll find that, I think, in the um, exact text I don't have before me. But the exact text is in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah speaks of saviors, plural. So you can have the ultimate savior who's God. You can have Jesus who is next to God in the hierarchy. And you can have human beings who can be called God and can be called savior. So you'll find all of that in our, if you just search at Focus on the Kingdom, you don't need to buy any books even, search these issues, these texts, and you'll find plenty of material on that. Uh, yeah, okay. so here's the uh, Nehemiah 927. 
where God, Yahweh, the one God of Israel, says, I will send them uh, deliverers or saviors. And also, I had put here uh, the reference Anthony mentioned about Jesus himself calling people gods. He says, look, look to your, he says to his own fellow Jews, which is sort of funny, right? He's teaching people who are going around calling him themselves teachers and wanting to be called teachers. And he says, look in your own law. Isn't that, isn't it, isn't it not written in your law? It's interesting. He uses your law as if uh, Jesus is above the law, uh, which might be an indication that he is actually above that old law. But anyway, I have said you are gods. As, as Anthony noted, Jesus is actually alluding to that Psalm 82. I have said you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. So in, in other words, act like it. If you, if you are gods in a secondary sense, representative sense, so they are representing the one God, Yahweh, the Father, then Jesus, again, is taking them to task and tell them, act, act like agents of the one God then since he gives you that exalted title. Very good. You make a good point there when you say, isn't it written in your law? Jesus, at that verse, distinguishes himself, distances himself for a moment from their law, the law of Moses. That would bear on the question we had earlier this evening, showing the difference in the law of Messiah, under which Paul was, and the law of Moses, under which Paul was not. So that's good. All right. So finally, the time is here. Yes. We will get to some questions from the internet. Okay. Thanks to everyone out there for taking your Friday night to watch us, listen to us. So we'll do the best we can. And Anthony always does. So let's go <laughs> to the first one here, Anthony. Um, Disciple Mike. I like that. Uh, yes. Is God using any particular organization, denomination today? Question from one of my JW friends to me to support the JW. Well, <laughs> you have to assess that depending on what these people are teaching. If God is using the watchtower uniquely to teach the truth, you've got to demonstrate that what they're teaching is the truth. When they say that Jesus is Michael, the archangel, that's simply wrong. Now, they do have some interesting truths like the sleep of the dead, what we call conditional immortality. But anybody who teaches the truth, not perfectly, I'm sure, I don't think anybody gets everything exactly right, but you're going to have to work that out yourself. I don't recommend, though, the Watchtower because there's a level of non-understanding there for which I don't blame them. They don't have the scholarly skills sometimes to work these things as well as they should because they don't believe in getting degrees at all. So there is a place for the specialist, the expert in, in Hebrew and Greek and so on. There's a place for him. It doesn't make him infallible. There's a place for him. So I don't know of any organization on that grand scale that is teaching all of these truths. So you get busy and do what you can, and you're part then of God's true organization provided you teach the truth as you establish it all right thank you we will go to the next hmm. question marta marta has yeah. matthew 28 19 hmm. been altered to contain the trinity formula yes well the answer is it hasn't been altered at all and it doesn't contain the trinity formula it says nothing about the three being one there yeah? You baptize them into, the Greek has into, into the combined character, authority of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say those are all three one God. You'd have to find verses for that before you, you would venture on that sort of line. And there's a nice text at the end of what is it, Second Corinthians, about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you can find that one, the fellowship of the Spirit, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, something to do with Jesus at the end of 2 Corinthians 3. No, 2 Corinthians, sorry. The end of 2 Corinthians. There it is. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. What about this? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all. There's no Trinity there. We believe in the Lord Jesus. We believe in God. But we've defined God as John 17, 3 says, You, Father, John 17, 3 says, You, Father, are the only one, or monos helithinos theos in the Greek, the only one who is true God. If that's not clear, nothing will be clear. Your child of two understands that. The Father, I repeat, is the only one. 1,300 times in the New Testament Greek scriptures, you'll find that atheos, meaning the God, refers to the Father alone. Jesus was a unitary monotheist, as any Jew of that time was. These people have never heard of the Trinity. It's like saying, what sort of software did Paul have on his computer? That's a silly question. No, everybody who has learning in the subject knows that there was no Trinitarian God in Bible times. That's a later development. Any good dictionary, the Hastings Bible Dictionary, the Dictionary of Christ and the Gospels, and so on and so on, will find this to be true. So don't let anybody tell you that let us make man means that God is triune. How do you know he wasn't five or six or seven? Simply wrong. You're desperately clutching at individual, isolated, taken out of context verses to support what the church may have taught you. That's not a good way to be a Berean. Yeah, and I also use this one, uh, Anthony, uh, uh, regarding this topic. As you can see there, so it says that, like Matthew, Paul uses three different terms pointing to one indivisible experience that is of conversion, baptism, and integration into the community, the church, if you will. So here are a couple interesting parallels to that. Matthew 28, 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, You were sinners, but you have been washed, purified, made holy. You have received God's approval in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You see how that's similar? Titus 3, God our Savior, Savior saved us through the washing into a new life by the Holy Spirit. So there you have God, the Holy Spirit poured out upon us through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And you can also compare that to 2 Corinthians 1, where God confirms us to Christ. So you got God, Christ, by the anointing and sealing of the Spirit. So you see there how you have that, that uh, similar so-called formula. But, but remember, as Anthony's saying, um, it's neither Trinitarian nor a formula. So it's not Trinity. It's not a formula. The Trinity, as, as Anthony was saying, the, the Trinity teaches that there is one God who is at the same time three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's not what Matthew is saying here. So, all right, we will move on. We have a couple more here, Anthony. Uh, here might be a toughie. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Are Trinitarians breaking the first commandment by worshiping Jesus? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. But with great respect, you're playing on the word worship. What do you mean by that? The word worship in your English or American today may well mean that the object is God. That's not so in the Bible. When I point out to you that the saints are going to be worshipped, you don't think that they're God. So you can worship Jesus by worshipping him as Messiah. That doesn't mean he's God. So you're playing, you're playing word tricks with yourself. I, I respectfully submit here. The word worship does not mean that the object of such worship is God. So we'll find the verse very quickly for you where I will make those Christians who have been done harm. Sorry, I will make those enemies of Christians, I should say, come and worship you, Jesus said in the beginning chapters of Revelation. I will make them come and worship you. I will make them come and fall down at your feet. The word worship there, proskineo. I'll make them fall down at your feet in worship. Same word. And acknowledge that I've loved, for you, loved you. So the Bible is not written in American English. It's written in Greek in the New Covenant and in Hebrew in the Old. So you must do it the honor of searching out the meanings of those words 
in context. I've used this example in class over the years. If I come to you in America and say, I'm mad about my flat, I'm mad about my flat. You say, oh, what's the problem? You're at the side of the road trying to change your tire. No. I said, I'm very excited about my apartment. I'm mad about my flat. That will illustrate, I hope, for all of you that words have meaning according to the language in which they're spoken. So don't be an amateur. You need some learning, some skills, some lexicons, and some time. And this is not an easy task to look up these words, see what the various possibilities are before jumping to a foregone conclusion. Yeah, and um, you also have uh, my my go-to text for the worship, Anthony, is uh, Isaiah 45, 14. Good. Uh, so this is a very impactful, or, or it should be a very impactful mm. verse for people who are using this word worship Absolutely. Uh, in the primary sense, yes. when it comes to Jesus, because worship, as, as you have explained, Anthony, has mm. different meanings. I mean, we just looked at the word God, by the way, right? Mm. For Jesus, the word God had a secondary meaning, clearly, yeah. in John 10. Yes. Because he called the judges of Israel gods. So is Jesus a uh, pagan? <laughs> you know, is he a... Uh... No, obviously not. So there are different meanings for words sometimes. Yes. And I don't know if you want to talk about this because uh, yeah. the Hebrew and the Greek, the Greek translation, yes. the, the words are the same words for worship and prayer to God himself, aren't yes. they? Yes, yes. And that's being offered then to your former enemies in the kingdom. They will make petition to you, the New Heart English Bible. They, these former enemies, will come to realize your value before God, and they, these enemies, former enemies, will make petition to you and recognize, surely God is in you and there is no other, no other God. Isn't that marvelous? That's in Exodus 11, no, verse 8. Is, uh, Isaiah 45, Sorry, 14. I got that wrong. Isaiah 45 and verse 14. Brilliant verse. You take that in your notes and help your friends with these things. All right, one more, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, how do you fit three yeah. days, three yeah. nights between yeah. Friday afternoon and Sunday morning? Well, we're on the same tack about language here. What you don't do is to take one verse, which says three days and three nights, and contradict 25 others. So the verse to start with in describing then the crucifixion and the resurrection is Luke 24, 21. Luke chapter 24 and verse 21 we have this luke 24 and verse 21 it's on the screen on the screen that is we had hoped the disciples are saying rather disheartedly disheartened disheartenedly we had hoped we'd hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, speaking of Messiah. Yes, and besides all that, today, and it's Sunday, they're speaking on a Sunday, is the third day since the crucifixion took place. Well, what on earth would that be? If you're talking on Sunday and the third day since Wednesday, that wouldn't work at all. So the third day, you can't inclusively, Luke has a couple of examples of Jesus talking about today, tomorrow and the third day. I think that's in Luke 12. Today, tomorrow, and the third day. That's counting inclusively. If you count inclusively, as Jesus himself does in the Gospel of Luke, then Friday is the third day back from Sunday, in counting inclusively. That will fit with every other verse. The other one, three days and three nights, is a Hebrew idiom. I deal with this in all my and other details on this interesting subject in my little booklet about uh, New Testament Christianity and the Sabbath. I think it's free online, if I remember. So you can check that out. But don't ever, ever use one verse to destroy the credibility of 20 others on the same subject. 
Yeah, and just to uh, ex expand on this a little mm. bit, Anthony. Yes, please. If I may. Yeah, please. Um, we, we've done a lot, or I've done a lot of on mm. this too. So to emphasize what Anthony's saying here, which is very important, yes. note uh, there that for Matthew, the phrase in three days, after three days, three days, three nights, mean the same thing. How do we know this? Because of what Anthony is telling you here, that there are two biblical methods employed, if you, if you look at it carefully, by the biblical writers. This way of counting, the, the Hebrew way of counting time, counting inclusively, as Anthony was saying, and uh, so-called Hebrew idioms or manners or ways of speaking. So when counting days, the Bible generally uses inclusive counting. And you have a lot of examples throughout the scriptures. Genesis 42, 17, Joseph's brothers are in prison three days and they're released on the third day. Um, so before the completion actually of a full three days, if you look at that record, in Second Chronicles, the king says, come back after three days. Yet, if you look at the context in verse 12, it says that the people reported back on the third day just as the king had ordered. So you'll note there that in actuality, the king had said after three days, not on the third day. And then you have other examples there you can look, look at for the sake of time. So here's a, I hope this uh, chart helps. As you can see there, as Anthony was saying, counting inclusively. You also have Luke 13.32 and uh, the affirmation Luke 24.21. So you have Friday day and night, that's one day, Saturday day and night, two days. And the Sunday, as the Jews count the days. So, if we apply this method of counting to his resurrection, uh, it might look something like this. So, you have Friday crucifixion, the today, the Sabbath, the tomorrow, the Sabbath day, and Sunday when he's raised on the on the on the first day of the week, as we know. So again, as we saw in Luke 24, 21, on the first day of the week, that is Sunday afternoon, uh, you had, for example, the man walking on the road to Emmaus. And, and as Anthony said, uh, talking about the third day since all these things occurred. So uh, I hope uh, that helps a little bit. If you have anything else to add there? Anthony? Well, yes, one other thing. Did you have there in your list Luke 13? 32 and 33. Uh, you may have had it in your previous list. Luke uh, 13. Yeah. It's there. It, uh, Luke okay. 13, 32 reference there. Uh, that's 24. Oh, okay. All right. It's and 33, twice there. Right. 32 and 33, today, tomorrow, and the third day, today, and tomorrow, and the next day. That's the inclusive way to count. So don't destroy that and create unnecessary chaos by making the Matthew 12 one contradict all of that evidence. Right. So th there you have those verses. Mm, so, good. Very good. And, uh, again, all, all these uh, videos, by the way, are uploaded automatically. You can go yep. back and slow it down. I know it's a lot of information yes. we're throwing at you. Uh, we don't expect you to get this on the, on the one go. But no. uh, uh, let's see. Let, let's do one last one. Anthony, yes. If you may. Yes, absolutely. Um, why does Jesus say the spirit of truth does not speak, speak of himself, but only speaks what he hears in John 16, 13? So who or what yeah. is Jesus talking about there, the spirit of truth? Uh, well, the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. Does not speak of itself or himself. What do I have in my translation there? Oh, this your translation? Uh, yes. Let's have a look at your mm -hmm. one got translation john 16 13 yes thank you yeah so you want to talk about the uh yeah the word there that sometimes is can be a he or an it or absolutely so there's your translation when the spirit of the truth comes you have it there yes 
will guide you into all the truth. So why, I guess the question would be then, why do some translations have a key there? Because they believe that the Holy Spirit is a third person. And I earlier said tonight, the Holy Spirit is very personal, but never a third person. The Spirit is God or Jesus speaking. And so the correct sense would be when the Spirit of the truth comes, it, that's to say God or Jesus speaking, it will guide you to all the truth. The Spirit will not speak on its own initiative, but it will speak. That's perfectly legitimate within the Greek language. The Greek verbs are entirely ambiguous. Either he or it would be perfectly fine. So I'm translating in a way which will harmonize with the rest of the texts on the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm trying to do there. Good. Yeah, is this uh, one of those uh, cases where grammatical gender should not be confused uh, with biological sex, I guess? Well, is it a matter of grammatical genders there regarding? Um, the more, more or less, not exactly parallel, but simply that the third person singular, the verb it speaks, right, is so, ambiguous. So if you go to Bible Hub, yes, you'll see that some translators Good. are for the he there. Yes. But I'm sure there are others. Let's see, it, if there's an it, maybe not. <laughs> Interesting. Is this he? <laughs> they okay. tend to use he because they're thinking of a third person. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I don't see even an it. So everyone uh, calls the spirit a he here. In the right hand column, didn't I see an it somewhere? Oh, we're looking at the left hand. The, oh, and that the one. First, the, the question is asking about right. Uh, okay. Thirteen. Yes. Well, could it also be possible that because the spirit is the spirit uh, of truth is God, mm. uh, could Jesus also be saying that God the Father will guide you into all things? Mm. I don't know. Well, it uh, amounts to that too. But when He, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Truth is the Spirit of God. The Spirit is an it. It's not a third person. But it is personnel. So it's not wrong to speak of the Spirit of God as a he, if by that you don't mean a third person. The verb itself doesn't tell you whether it's a he or it. Depends on the context. And I take the Spirit of Truth there to be an it. The Spirit of the Truth. It's All also right. God speaking. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks everyone out there for your good mm -hmm. questions. And sorry yeah. if I did not get to others. Thank you. We will leave it there, and um, we shall return next month. We do this once a month now. Uh, let's see. Before we go, do we have any announcements? Uh, I guess not. So, all right. We will be back in uh, the month of October. Once again, we do this. Uh, monthly and again here is our website if you have any other questions as Anthony was saying we do have a search tool there as you can see just type in a phrase a word a verse chapter and verse preferably and you should be able to see what we have written on the subject and I'm sure we have covered it Sir Anthony has uh, 60 almost 60 plus years of doing this so and we have many books, many articles, and uh, all good stuff there. So thanks a lot. God bless. And until we meet again. Oh, by the way, before we go, we do have Greek lessons with Sir Anthony. And the next one is the next Wednesday, which is September the 8th. If you are interested in these lessons, learning New Testament Greek, with Sir Anthony, contact me. Uh, actually, I'll just put there, there's the email. So this is a uh, New Testament Greek lessons we do with a UK group, UK based group there. So if you're interested, let us know. All right, good night.